All right, we are back live with another ZDTV. And, uh, you know, the weather here in Western New York is, as you might expect, a little gray, a little rainy. What are we doing today? Uh, today, we're going to be taking a look at the .NET SDK or the C Sharp SDK. It's written in C Sharp. Um, and we're just going to explore the project, look at the samples, try to get it all running using nothing but Windows. That's uh, sometimes a challenge because Microsoft and Bash and scripts, you know, sometimes as a Microsoft developer, you want a PowerShell script, but you'll get a Bash script and then you'll have to translate from Bash to PowerShell or to Command or whatever. Uh, that's where Go actually is really nice, where it compiles down and lets you produce a binary that'll work on multiple platforms relatively easily. So let's take a look at the ZD SDK for C Sharp. If you are not familiar with the project itself, let's uh, bring up a new window here and turn off my bookmarks so I get a little bit more space. I go to uh, github.com slash openzd slash zd hyphen sdk hyphen c sharp and make it comically big so that it fits on the screen. When we do that, uh, you'll see that there's a nice little readme. It's got a great little graphic that's been out there. All of our SDKs have the nice uh, common graphic. So if you go to the C one, you'll see the same sort of graphic. You go to the Python one, uh, you'll see the same sort of graphic, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we've looked at uh, C before. We've looked at uh, Python before. We've never looked at the .NET SDK. The .NET SDK is a little bit special because it uses the C SDK under the hood. And when I say it's special, it's not special as far as our SDKs go. We have a Python SDK that does the same thing. We have a Swift SDK that does the same thing. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Um, so it's not special in that regard, but it's special insofar as it's .NET. And with .NET Core, Microsoft is making this push to, I mean, they don't say it, but they want to be the new Java is what it seems like, right? Uh, write once, run anywhere, the classic trope from the old Java days. Any of my Java devs friends out there, uh, remember that? You can holler at me. Oh, we got Ken taking a look. Hey, Ken. Ken's out there. Just listening in today, I can. I wish the little popcorn yellow striped smiley thing came through, but apparently it doesn't. Um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, .NET SDK does use the C SDK under the hood. So all of the um, .NET isms that you're familiar with are not familiar. You know, they, they wouldn't be something that you'd be familiar with when you start consuming the C SDK. We'll take a look at that in a second. Um, it does do all the normal stuff, you know, it uses libsodium because it uses the CSDK. Uh, it's going to have you get started by making some identities and doing some samples. So, you know, you can take a look, pretty nice looking readme out here. Uh, you can go through and read that. Um, there is uh, native logging that we'll take a look at because, uh, since we're consuming another SDK under the hood, you're going to want to be able to get access to whatever the native logging might respond to you. So we'll take a look at that and what that looks like. And then, uh, well, first of all, we're going to take a look at the native NuGet package. Because, like I said, we do use the CSDK, and it does need to be a NuGet package, which is consumable from Linux and from Mac and from Windows. And so, if we get time, we'll actually try it out on Linux, and we'll try it out on, on Mac, even. I have all three available to me. And so, with that said, you know, let's get into it. Uh, rotating the NuGet API key, you don't have to worry about that. That's really just a note for me because every year it, it runs out and I have to go and rotate the, the NuGet key or whoever the next maintainer might be. Um, yeah, so let's take a look. Let's flop over to Visual Studio. And the first thing you'll see is that Visual Studio, I'm using the Community Edition. Uh, if you like using VS Code, great. Um, I'm not using VS Code, so, you know, your mileage will vary on this particular um, situation. But one of the things I might want to use VS Code for is because you can see, you know, Visual Studio doesn't make these menus particularly easy for me to show you. I was actually trying to find it just before um, the stream started. And, you know, you come in here into environment and fonts and colors and like there's not just one that you set that does all of them. I know it's in here because I know I've changed it before. 
but I do not know what it is. And so since I let's 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 try this one. We'll just try this one real quick. This might be it. And we'll see what happens if I go to 16. And yeah, yeah, sure. Let's see what happens. And nothing, nothing happened. All right, whatever. Uh, I can make the individual text editor bigger using my scrolly wheel, and I can't make it bigger anywhere else. So if somebody wants to or can't see a thing, you know, maybe you gotta pause the video and zoom in. It should be coming through in 1080p, so it should be legible. If it's not legible, maybe Ken will hit me up and let me know, or anybody else who's watching the stream. All right, so let's take a look. Um, first thing I wanted to do, I, see, I can make that bigger, so we'll be all right. I was going to look at the uh, samples, but we'll do the samples afterward. The first thing I actually want to do is look at the native package and you'll see here's our solution file oh you know what i should point that out let's go to a command window where we have the c sharp and do an ls inside of here and when you clone get info when you clone this repository using https or um, ssh like i have here you'll see here are all the files that come through and one of those files is the zd native api for dotnet core uh, and so I'm going to change into this directory and do another ls and you'll see a whole bunch of CMake. You know what? Let me make this smaller too so we can get more on the screen for now. And so you'll see a whole bunch of CMake stuff. If you're not familiar with CMake, then, you know, not a big surprise. The sidebar and console font is barely legible, but the L but the editor is clear. Yeah, that's going to be that's going to be what's if, if you want to go look at tell me how I can change the editor font in visual studio boy that that'd be cool but i could i couldn't find it before all right um so here we are uh you'll see a bunch of c make stuff and that c make stuff is um how we end up building the native library for dotnet uh we change very very little and so if we take a real quick look at the c make lists file um, that's really big. Uh, let's see if I just shrink it down a tiny bit for now. All right. Uh, and so you'll see things like this generate.net status. That's one of the things that we do out of this, um, native library, because we want to turn the, uh, enums that are declared inside of errors.h. And we want to basically make them into, you know, C sharp enums so that they're actually legible and idiomatic a big function of the c sharp sdk is really just translating the c sdk into idiomatic c sharp that's what we're trying to do here anyway and so by generating the zd status cs using uh the precompiler little tricks um we get a file that looks you know reasonable and so from this directory if i cat that particular file where's my mouse you should see here are the ZD statuses, right? And so where you would get a negative five in C, you'll get PKCS7 ASN parsing failed. So you get a reasonable error message as opposed to negative five, and then you gotta go back to look it up in errors.txt. Okay, so that's what this project is doing. It is a complicated little tomato, and uh, I'm going to blog about it someday just because it's not particularly easy to produce a cross-platform native NuGet package. Uh, it is actually pushed out to NuGet.org though. So if you were to go out and look for OpenZD on NuGet.org, you will see there is an OpenZD.net native and it's currently behind a little bit. Uh, we're at 36.10, I think now. And so I was trying to update that earlier and ran into a few build problems. So it's relatively recent, but it's not the latest, latest. That'll get updated at some point soon. But that is out here. Now, I only mention that because if we go back to the NuGet, uh, sorry, the NuGet, to the solution file. Oh, I wanted to show that too. Uh, let's see if we back up a level. You'll see there is a, where is the solution? There it is. There is a zd.nuget.solution file that contains all these things. And that's what I've opened up in here. And, um, I am the kind of .NET developer where I actually like to uh, look at and edit the, where is, he, edit, edit, edit. where is edit, there it is, the project file. A lot of .NET devs don't 
go that far, but um, for example, this particular project has a special target called download management YAML. It uses the PowerShell command. You do need PWSH and not PowerShell. It uses invoke web request and goes out and gets the management spec and writes it to a file, which is then supposed to be included in um, open API reference. But I see here, I don't know if I've got a problem because I got management and MGMT. And so I do have, you know, maybe a bug in that. But this is the sort of thing that you'll find out here. And that solution file contains the relevant .NET portions that you need to look at. It doesn't contain that native project. If you're interested in the native project, look at things like, um, oh, that's really fun. Uh, the native new set spec, this guy right here. Uh, look at the build dot bats look at the github workflows which builds the native nuget publish look at all those things all right and now last but least not least is if i go and i look at the nuget packages for the openzd.net project and look at the installed yeah you will see hopefully you can kind of see it the openzd.net native so the openzd.net c -sharp project will import the openzd.net native project. Um, I've tested it on everything I could test it on. I did not test it on an iPhone. I did not test it on Android. I, so, you know, if you're using Maui, I never got around to being able to test it with Maui. I am interested to know if it'll just work. I tried, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So let me know. Okay. So all that preamble aside, the next thing we're going to talk about is the samples. We're going to run some samples. And so if I open up the samples project and open the readme inside of here, I'm going to actually open this inside of um, the, the rendered GitHub page samples. So if you go to the samples, <clears throat> You can see it tells you how you can quickly and easily get the ZDCLI on your path if you have PowerShell installed. You can invoke a web request to go out and get this little PowerShell script. And you can take a look at this and read it. I run it all the time, so it's safe and secure, promise. But you should read it before you just go execute it. And what it will do is it will just go out and get you ZD by downloading the latest version. Now, if you're going to follow along, there's a bug somewhere, and I think it's in that management the MGMT thing. I tried this with version 1.0. If you haven't heard, OpenZD 1.0, that's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, but when I went to run the samples, I ran into a problem. So instead, I've downloaded version 34.2. And so if you look at my ZD CLI command here, and I type uh, version. This will tell me it's version 34.2. So I apologize. By the time maybe you watch this, maybe it'll all be fixed up. But if you want to run that invoke web request right here, you can do that. And so when you run it, it says, where should ZD be installed? It tells you where its default is. I always just take the default. And it says, would you like to add it to your path? And so I often say yes. And so if I say ZD version now, we'll get 1.0. But remember, when I ran the samples with 1.0, it didn't work. So I, I'm, I'm going to try to fix that today. Um, so instead, I'm going to be using ZD 4.0.34.2, which I put here. And so I can actually copy this on top of this. Uh, is it yeah. And now when I run ZD version, I should get 34.2. Also notice we fixed the ZD version in, in 1.0 so that it looks a little bit nicer. It doesn't have all this extra fluff. Okay, so let's just assume, we'll just wave our hands, magic hands, right, that we've gotten the ZD CLI on our path. And that's important because without the ZD CLI, we can't start a uh, local developer environment. So right now, if you come out and you type the word ZD Edge Quick Start, and you'll see I have two windows because I'm going to start it in one and do commands in the bottom one. But if I run ZD Edge Quick Start, the ZD CLI will just go out there and it'll start a whole entire Open ZD Overlay network for you that fast. It's only going to be usable from your local network. 
And the reason why, and let's uh, make this big smaller now, because now we remember this this is where ZD is going to just be running. If I hit Control C up here, it'll all just go away. It uses a temp directory. If you want it to stick around, you know, learn what the home flag does, but I don't want it to stick around. I'm using uh, temp directories every time. So every time I stop and start it, I got to redo everything. Mm -hmm. So let's restart my ZD Edge Quick Start. And the reason why I was talking about that, oh, actually, let's see. Uh, it'll tell me where my temporary directory is probably way up here, way up here, way up here. Where, where did I run the quick start right there? Quick start. And it doesn't tell me where the directory is. It's going to tell me in here somewhere. Um, temp, temp, T E M P. That's in the temp. There it is. Okay. And so let's go to here, temp, quick start, 224, that looks right. Okay, 224, 128, yeah. And so uh, the reason why it's important, as I was saying before, it's only usable for your local environment is because if we take a look at this controller.yaml file in Notepad++, and we go down and we find the address field, the advertised address, You'll see it's going to use your host name. My host name happens to be SG4. And so hope it'll use the default SG4-1280. Now you can change that. You can uh, see Edge Quick Start. Oh boy, CD Edge Quick Start. You can use controller CTRL address, I think. Uh, let's see, you can use controller address and you can use router address and control all of this. So if you want to host it somewhere else, you can host it somewhere else. But by default, it'll use your host name. So most likely everything on your local area network will be able to access this. If not, then you can use controller address, controller host name, and controller port and router port if you want to control those things. All right, I'm not going to bother with that. I'm just going to do all this locally so it doesn't matter. So now I can log in. ZD Edge login. Uh, username is admin, password is admin by default. And now you can see I've logged in. If I do a ZD edge list, uh, let's do it. I'll, I'll type it out. Edge routers. You can see I have a quick start edge router and everything's working. If I uh, go over to my HTTPS colon slash slash local host 1280, you'll see I get a little too big. You'll see I get the version information for my SG4-1280. Everything's ready to roll. All right. So that's uh, that's a little bit of setup, a little preamble for that setup. Now let's talk about uh, where is my... Uh, no, 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 no. Find, I want to find that readme. I think I closed it when I, when I went to here, didn't I? <laughs> I did. Here it is. Okay. Open ZD samples. So there are quite a few samples that ship with the C Sharp SDK to give you a flavor of what it is and what it's about. Um, enrollment, we'll talk about enrolling an Open ZD identity. Now, all of these services, they actually use this enrollment uh, functionality to run. You, you should, I also have to make one more change, right? Uh, a lot of developers like to run their samples from the IDE. If you wanna do that, then it'll work right out of the gate. So let's go ahead and just run one and just see what it looks like. I'm going to pick the weather sample. And so if I open the weather sample and start looking at the code, you'll see that there's a custom property called weather on this thing. And this is the little magical way that I used in order to find what sample you want to dispatch to. If you look at the program, uh, actually, if I go back and look at you, let's show you the git. Oh, no, I stopped that. Oh, well, this is what I wanted. Uh, go back to... Um, uh, open ZD and ZD SDK C sharp. And if I do a git status, you'll see I do have a teeny tiny change on this file where I'm now trying to be smart about this. When you, when you dot net, so if you're using Linux or you're using Mac, you probably are using dot net run to run a sample. So like before, if you were using dot net run, it, this, this wouldn't work because, uh, when you run .NET run, arg0 is actually the name of the C-sharp project for reasons like 
can't explain. When you run it from Visual Studio, Arc Zero is not the name of the C-sharp project. So it's really quite annoying, honestly. But if you look in here now, you'll see I've got this little section that detects that detects whether or not Arc Zero is an app domain. And you can see I was working on this just before, and it's not quite done yet. But if you come out here and in Visual Studio, again, apologize for the teeny tiny little menu. I'm going to go down to the OpenZD.NET Samples Debug Properties. And I really wish Visual Studio would fix this dialog because it is also hideous. But under Command Arguments or Command Line Arguments, what it says right here, you can add a command line argument. And I've added the word weather. That says weather, W-E-A-T-H-E-R. And so now when I run my sample by clicking the little run button, what will happen is the sample will bootstrap itself. And I'll show you the output whenever the little black window pops up because I have to bring it over to the screen. And you'll see when I run this, it'll say it's using the default username of admin the default password of admin. So if you want to change those, you can change those. It'll use localhost 1280, and then it'll configure your overlay. It'll create an identity for you. It'll create a host config. It'll create a, uh, <laughs> look at that bug, creating a host v1 config, but then it creates an intercept v1, obviously a copy paste error. It'll then create a service for you, and then a couple of policies. These are the whole, this is what you need to do when you're using OpenZD. Uh, you need to make, well, you don't need to make an intercept, but it's friendly to have intercepts. You definitely have to have an offload location. So you oftentimes have a host config. You must have a service. That is the thing that aggregates configurations together. And then you always have to authorize those services. And so you usually will make a dial policy to let an identity dial or connect to a service. And you'll make a bind policy to let an identity host a service. And so here you can see I've used wttr.in as a sample and only because it looks pretty right like look at that's nice it's a nice little if you curl to wttr.in let's go ahead and do that uh i don't know if it'll work in powershell because powershell's a pain but wttr.in yeah all right so it looks actually looks nice sometimes in the old days back before windows it started you know getting its uh terminal on this would look like ugly but now it looks great and you'll see partly cloudy Friday, April 19th. This is the same stuff that you see here because what's happened is my .NET program has connected to OpenZD, has sent a message from my edge router because that's how I've configured this particular sample to WTTR.in and that's why the curl looks identical. If I were to run WTTR.in or if I were to run my overlay network from say Amazon, then the detected IP address and locality that it is determined would not be noticeable, right? It would be different. It would be Virginia or Ohio or, you know, wherever you are. Uh, but because I'm running this locally, it's not the best of demos because I can run all this stuff locally, but it does. If you go and look at the sample, it does show you exactly how it did all those things. So here's the sample base and, oh boy, that was too small. All right. That's what I want. Here's the sample base, and, and this is everything that is inclusive of this particular sample. There is some magic going on with the setup weather example. So if I go into the setup weather example, you can see where the magic is. So here's the word configuring overlay, recreating the identity, uh, bootstrap and enroll the identity, right? So there's there's some more code behind here than what I've shown you, but it's not, you know, it's not so much code. But this does tell you exactly how you could use .NET to uh, configure your OpenZD overlay. Like I did not run the ZD CLI commands here. I could have chosen to. Let's go back over to here and see ZD uh, edge list services. You'll see I have a weather demo service now. So that's cool. If I do a ZD edge list service policies, you'll see I have two demo policies. So the .NET SDK actually configured your whole overlay network on your behalf. Now, not all the SDKs do this for you. I went through and did this because I thought it'd be nice. And so now you've run your weather sample. Let's see, we can also run a server sample. And let's go back and look at 
Um, by the way, I don't know if anybody wants, I was just going to show all the samples working and then, uh, you know, we can go from there. Uh, the enrollment sample, I'm just going to skip over. If you're interested, you, you have to have an OpenZD identity. If you're watching a live stream about OpenZD and the c -sharp SDK, you probably already know that. You've probably already tried to um, download an identity and all that sort of stuff. Let me see, where would that bootstrap enroll? But if you're interested, uh, here's how I did it. I get a, a random file name using path. I'll get random file name. And then I write all of the bytes from uh, the client JSON. And the client JSON was done by openzd.api.enrollidentity. And it's a one-time JWT enrollment. And so it's that's really it. <laughs> it's not a lot to it. All right. So let's go back and let's look at the Reflect server now. The Reflect server is interesting because it shows you how to create a server side and a client side example and so if we look at the hosted server again uh, there'll be a little sample custom property up here it'll tell you what you need to supply to the program in order to run it. oh let's go run let's go run this with dotnet run now so i did say uh, i made it work with dotnet run and so i should be able to dotnet run the oh boy open zd uh, i'm not in the right directory cd to the samples directory uh, net run open ZD samples project and I'm going to run the weather example this time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's busy building hopefully it's not going to tell me it's in use it's not okay cool now it does all the same stuff that you saw before it'll use the admin password um, do notice that it it also waits for a terminator and tells you how long it takes um, when you create a server so most people aren't going to bootstrap the whole thing and start it all up, right? And so instead, what they'll usually do is they'll bootstrap it or configure it, however you want to think of the words. And then they'll get their identity, and then they'll turn their identity on. If you have that flow, then there's no delay, right? Because as soon as your identity comes online, it gets the configuration from the controller. But because I'm doing this all in one fell swoop, I had to add a little wait for the Terminator uh, stuff. And so that's because the, uh, the the process that starts up and listens needs to make sure that the router is notified. And so it's not about the C-sharp side here. It's actually about the router. Don't forget that router is running up here. And you can see validating Terminator popped up up here. So the router is running and the router is uh, pulling the controller every now and again to say, hey, do I have any, do I have any new identities? Do I have any new identities? And so when I recreate recreate the identity and when I recreate the service I actually remove the terminator from the router the terminator is the place where traffic the place where you'll send your traffic to on the OpenZD overlay which then decides how to handle that traffic so in the server example I'm going to show you the server example handles the traffic itself and that's where you'll hear me say you know, you'll have an actually dark server because it'll have no listening ports because it will establish listeners on the overlay network, not on the underlay network. And that's really, really powerful. So now I'll have a, when I, when I run it, I'll have a server that listens on the overlay is only attachable by uh, OpenZD. You have to be on the overlay network. You have to be authorized before you can connect to that server. We'll do that in a second. But in this example, I've used a terminator, or well, I've really just configured an identity to host a service and, or bind. <clears throat> and when I do that, the router has a small little poll window, and so you gotta wait a tiny bit. Uh, but you see, you know, depending on what cycle you get, it might be no, no seconds, it might be, I think, up to 15. Uh, but you can see, poof, you know, the whole thing ran, we get the same little pretty results. Uh, thanks to WTTRN that, for making this, and it looks like Igor Chubin. Oh, I love WTTRN for a sample. Okay. Whew. So that's about the weather example. Now, instead, let's come back over and take a look at, we have the hosted service example, and we have the hosted client example. So I'm going to run the hosted example down here, and let's actually... Let's make another window by duplicating this one and putting it down here. 
and bigoting it, changing to the same directory. That looks about the same size. All right, so now let's do a .NET run, open ZD samples, and we'll do hosted. And so you'll see it'll do the whole same thing as it did before, where it'll go through, it'll have to build first, and then it'll configure the overlay and then say, hey, I'm attached to the edge router, and everything's up and running. Okay, so now my hosted service is sitting there and waiting. And so now I can do the same thing, .NET run, open ZD, uh, hosted client. And this will go through. It'll also um, create an identity, bootstraps its own self again. Oh, I can't, okay, I can't .NET run it. So let's try that again. So you can't .NET run it because when you .NET run, it tries to build it. So let's find dot dash name star dot e x e x e uh file not found is that because find is the wrong it's the wrong find all right i don't know where this thing goes let's go back into wsl because it has the proper find command find dot dash name star dot e x e and then exit back out again okay so it looks like it puts it into bin debug net six so bin debug net six open zd uh, dot net samples exe and then hosted okay you also see it's a lot faster because it doesn't recompile everything bin debug net six open zd dot net uh, samples exe hosted client okay and Looks like things have happened. Receiving connection from, now look at this, hosted demo service client. So the server knew exactly what identity has connected to it. That's pretty cool. And so now I can say hi there, hi there. And the host demo server said says that that client sent hi there. I replied to hosted demo client. And then the hosted demo client says, hi, hosted demo service client. Thanks for sending. <laughs> I I, uh, I make myself laugh. I thanks for sending me hi there. <laughs> um, here is another uh, another message. How was that? And you can see the server just it just it's called the reflect server for a reason. It just returns back whatever you sent. And so now we have run, uh, in fact, I wonder what the, oh, look at that. I, I killed this, the server first and that disconnected this. Um, did it disconnect? I don't know. Oh yeah, it's, uh, it's done reading. So uh, let's try weather again up here. And you can see, boop, boop, boop. Now it still waits for that terminator. Like I said, the terminator will show up up here somewhere. And there it goes. And now you get your service back. Okay, cool. So those are the two things. Um, that's... And then let's do the appetizer next. All right, so if you haven't seen the appetizer, mm, I should send people to this appetizer instead. If you haven't seen this appetizer, I would recommend go to openzd.io slash appetizer and check it out. Uh, soon enough, we'll have a taste of ZD. I don't know what the status is of that. I am I did this one, so I know what the status is, but I've seen the taste of ZD. And it's very similar, except it uses Java, uses Go, uses, I think it uses C, maybe Python. It's a bit more of an expanded example. But this is nice because if you come out to here and look at it, you'll see a nice little uh, example of what happens. And this is something that that guy, Ken, this guy right here, Ken, in case you haven't seen him, he hasn't been on the ZDTVs because we, we had a little hiatus and we had a hiatus um, for a, a couple of months. Ken and I usually host together. Sometimes host together, I should say, often host together. And so Ken actually uh, helped with this um, reflect, uh, not reflect demo. This is a appetizer demo. And what we do here, if we come down and take a closer look, what you can do is you can click the view all button, if that's your style, and you can read about what happens here. Or you can view them as a slideshow and go next, next, next. Now with myself in the way down here and... You know, the last time I tried to move this thing, it wouldn't let me put it in. Oh, I remember. Let's do it ah, that way. And so uh, because I've made this thing comically large, this little live reflect messages will display here kind of occludes the next button. But you can see there's a next button. 
Uh, let's see. Ooh, how about rotating client certificates from time to time? In what way that is the question that's come in about rotating client certificates from time to time? Um, when you say rotating the, the certificates, what do you mean? From the client's identity itself, the OpenZD identity itself? Um, please follow up and then I'll answer. So if you take a closer look here, you can click the little next button and you can see that when you when you are establishing your your Reflect server, this is actually running out there in Amazon land. Uh, Cloud vendor is Amazon in this case. And this Reflect server is an application embedded server, which is um, running from Go. And so what you can do is it connects to the OpenZD overlay, and then your computer can run the appetizer, which will actually connect to this Reflex server. And then you can send that Reflex server some zero trust uh, messages. And we'll do that with C-sharp right now. And so um, when we run, uh, I don't think I need this. I think I'm going to run this one. And let's go back and find the name of the appetizer. My guess would be, nope. It's appetizer reflect. I thought it was going to be appetizer. So let's go ahead and run the appetizer reflect. Oh no. Well, this is embarrassing. All right. So what do we do wrong here? Uh, program line 74 failed to execute. Index was outside of the bounds of an array. So now we've got to do some live debugging. Appetizer sample line 39. Context from file args1. Huh. Well, that is a conundrum. Args one. That should not be the case. You should it should have gone out and made you an identity, or at least told you, right? Like it should have said you needed to provide some more uh, more inputs there. Let's go back and look at the program because I do remember seeing this one. Ah, uh, so this one uh, does expect an identity file. So, ah, okay, now it makes sense. Now it makes sense as to why it's using this appetizer URL, because you can come out here and give it your email address. I mean, you don't have to do that, by the way. It can just be Tomato Bob. Let's, let's, say, let's say Tomato Bob. And then add me to OpenZD. And then you can do all this with, with Go, uh, but the most important thing here is the downloading of the token file. So let's go ahead and download Tomato Bob. And then we can come over here and run C colon temp Tomato Bob. And it will enroll. It says it, it assumes it's a token to enroll. Let's bring this back on the screen because it's important. And so anybody out there who maybe is doing this can also see it and do it themselves. Oh, that's some fun little CSS problems right there. <laughs> okay, so let's say uh, hi there. This is ZDTV and Tomato Bob. And so it's a look. It even knows the 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 identity that's been connected to it, and it says hi there. This is ZDTV and Tomato Bob. And then on top of that, there's apparently a read problem with the C sharp appetizer demo because that is clearly sitting there waiting to flush or waiting to do something i don't exactly know what but that's a bug that's another bug um well it's a bummer i thought i had that working all right so the second time around you run this uh you'll notice it doesn't have to go through and, and bootstrap itself it finds that it's already bootstrapped that token um let's say something like um i want to murder people and this is why Ken will come up and be important or or not. So what's what's supposed to happen is um, that Reflect server that's running out there is actually running this through a uh, LLM that is looking for hate speech. And so maybe that's not hate speech. It's not enough of a hate speech. We used to use I hate babies, but I hate babies has no longer been classified as hate speech for whatever reason. Let me go back and dig up my examples and see if I can't find one where the um, the text is actually uh, not considered acceptable. So uh, let's see. I want to murder my mother was what I used last time. Ah. All right. Well, I can't explain why those are getting classified as acceptable, but I do know those are actually going 
to an LLM, which is then checking. Oh, well, let's try this one. Let's try men are evil. There we go. All right. So that did not show up here because that did hit the LLM and that did uh, indicate that it was hate speech because it identified a group. I guess my mother's not a group. And so individuals are okay to hate on, but not a group. All men are evil. And what will happen there is uh, you're supposed to see, again, if there wasn't a flush bug, you would see a, um, a response that indicates you know, that you have sent some hate speech and, you know, you're supposed to be a nice person and it didn't show up over here. Now I've got two bugs to fix, apparently. The flush issue on the sit in the appetizer. I must not have pushed or something. I don't know. I did have that fixed at some point, but I'll, I'll fix that up as well. So I gotta, I'm going to fix up the fact that it doesn't work with ZD 1.0 and I'm going to fix up the flush bug on the appetizer. All right, so that's three samples. Oh, we did have a follow-up, doesn't matter, either from a client side or the controller APIs. All right, so uh, we have a question, Julian, about rotating client certificates. Right now, OpenZD does not enforce, and uh, I don't want to say doesn't support, doesn't really support rotating certificates in an easy way. What it does support instead is external JWT providers and so you could acquire short-term or short short-lived certificates from something like spiffy or spire um so spiffy and spire if you haven't seen them before and i'm actually going to go to a uh different repository this one this repository is a, a talk i gave at qcon last year and it shows you how to use OpenZD with spiffy and spire now i used go and not c sharp so like if you know go then great this will translate if you don't know go then you'll have to massage this and take the bits that you want from it but out here you'll find the uh securing apis and so if you're looking at doing short term short term certificates that roll uh integrating spiffy inspire was actually really easy with OpenZD and does allow for that kind of um rolling OpenZD itself doesn't have any uh, requirements around the lifetime of how long your certificates last. By default, OpenZD does not change and does not verify and validate your incoming TLS connections because, um, in my opinion, until a certificate is uh, classified as actually compromised, it's it's not compromised and there's no need to roll it. But really, the the bigger longer reason is just because um watching people uh deal with devices that have been deployed to the field like when you as, as somebody who's come from the iot sector when you build a product and you ship that product and that product sits on a shelf for a year you can't have short-term certificates so uh in order to have uh, longer term like products uh, we don't validate it you however can change that you can if particularly if you're writing your own sdk app right like you've seen i even rolled my own indent identity if you are the uh deployment um if you're the product developer you can absolutely roll your own certificates it's just not built into zd at this time um it has uh it has come up from time to time it is something that people ask about and uh spiffy spire does a really great job of it and so a lot of times what i i tend to say is you can also uh, compromise by using Spiffy Inspire over OpenZD, if that's the kind of thing that you want to do, because OpenZD is just the transport. If you add a third layer of um, uh, security by having a secure protocol of your own, like SSH or HTTPS or whatever, uh, OpenZD is just the secure pipe from your app to there. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. I understand I was looking for key cloak. Makes sense. All right, cool. Um, yeah, so if you haven't, uh, you know, you can go out and check out this. It's a PowerPoint presentation. If you have PowerPoint, great. If you have Google, it'll murder the slides, which is a bummer. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I probably should link to the actual, oh, look at that. I did. I did it myself. So there's a link to it. You can watch your own. You can watch me uh, talk about it if you're interested. Okay. 1144, getting towards the end. There is also an open API pet store demo. Um, this is interesting because uh, if you have a Docker-based environment, 
you can run you can run the pet store demo let's go and look at the this right here run pet store uh, swagger host swagger url yeah right there so um where's the docker run swagger host swagger oh yeah there it is okay so uh there is a pet store docker container that you can run and if you run it and put it someplace safe and secure that only you can access then you know so like oftentimes when i do the stuff i'll i'll deploy my overlay network in amazon and then i'll run docker right next to the one in amazon and then i know for sure i can't get there from here because i don't go and i open up the amazon's vpc right so no inbound firewall rules very common trope you'll hear from openzd keep all those firewall holes closed and so when I do this sort of stuff, I will prove to myself that it, it is not accessible by deploying it somewhere else. The other way you can do it is to actually not expose a port and add the pet store demo to a Docker network. You do need a Docker network so that uh, DNS works. And so if you use like a, one of our Docker Compose examples or just a Docker example, you'll set up a Docker network because that's what the instructions tell you to do. And then you can attach this pet store demo to that Docker network and then configure your overlay network in that way. Um, I actually don't know if the sample has a, oh, it does have a set up pet store example. Oh, nice. So we can take a look at that. Let's see, uh, appetizer, pet store, pet store sample. Yeah, let's see what it does. All right, uh, makes the identity, creates a config, pet store address. Oh uh, yeah, that's actually, I mean, I'm gonna pat myself on the back. That's actually not too bad. All right, so yeah. So, you, you know, if you have this running somewhere else, you can very easily override the desired intercepts, the desired ports, all that sort of stuff. And then you can do the pet store demo. Um, this is only out there to show you how to integrate the uh, the client, an HTTP uh, client with a server that's listening somewhere using an intercept address. And so in this case, we use an HTTP client, which is um, system.net HTTP. And you're able to override the DNS entry by using the, uh, the intercept address of your choosing. And so that's what this desired intercept is all about. And so you'll be going to, you know, HTTP colon slash slash my pet store. And that will be what your client uses. And obviously my pet store is not a legitimate address on uh, the underlay network. It's only legitimate on the overlay network. And you'll see the magic of how all that works. Okay. Well, we're 50 minutes in to the ZDTV. I think that's probably all I have to talk about when it comes to the SDKs, how to run the samples, how they bootstrap themselves. If you're using the samples and you find any other bugs, please do let me know. Um, file an issue, hit us up on Discourse, and uh, I'll try to get those two bugs that we discovered today fixed up. Hopefully that was a fun ZDTV. I had fun. I haven't looked at the C Sharp SDK for a while. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time on ZDTV. Bye, everybody.